The following interview was conducted with Olivia Wood, Professor Emerita of Foods, Food and Nutrition for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, June 10, 2013 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, Professor Emerita of Library Science. Olivia, good afternoon and welcome. Welcome. This Thank is you. such a thrill. My pleasure. Yeah. So let's start. Tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents and early years. Okay. Well, the voice will tell anybody if they ever listen that I'm not a Hoosier. Um, I was born in North Carolina and in an absolutely gorgeous area. I actually was born in Asheville, North Carolina because I was my mother's fourth pregnancy, and there, uh, I only have one living sibling. There had been two children lost. And so um, I'm from a town in the middle of the Smoky Mountains called Bryson City, North Carolina, which is near Cherokee. And 80% of the county that, that I am from is National Park. So when my mother was in her fourth pregnancy, they decided that she needed to go 60 miles to Asheville to a larger medical facility since there had been two uh, problem births. And so I was actually born in Asheville, but I'm from Bryson City, okay. North Carolina. Okay. Um, a, a, a beautiful place. I have come to really appreciate Indiana considering I came from where you don't look out the window and see anything but mountains. And I've come to appreciate people up here that like to look out and see wide open spaces. And, and um, uh, But I, I think I'm probably a bloom where you're planted person. So anyway, good. so okay. I grew up in a small town. The whole county only has, still only has uh, 8,000 people in it. And it's a tourist town. Very, um, the economy is, um, was very good when I was growing up. I was born in 47, so I'm a war baby. Um, the second year, I guess, of the baby boomers. And everywhere that I graduated from high school, college was always the largest class to graduate at that time. We were the ones that pushed the limits. And my um, mother and father owned a small motel. It only had 13 rooms. And my mother was a registered nurse. And my father um, had lived his whole life in that town. My mother was from over near Asheville. And um, he was from a very um, prominent political and um, medical family. His father and his grandfather were both physicians. And this was back when there was only one physician in a little horse and buggy town. So, um, and my father was mayor, and my one of my um, uncles, his father's only brother, was a senator from North Carolina. So, it was a very um, a family that really, I grew up really seeing my parents involved in everything. But in a small town, parents are involved in everything. That's so, right. And I think that probably really enhanced the fact that I really got very active later in my professional association. Sure. I really enjoyed it. Right, exactly. Yeah. But I, I, but I think that with it. all goes back, I grew up with it. Right. So I have one brother, and he lives in North Carolina, in Lenore, North Carolina, and he's recently retired. He was personnel manager for Broyhill Furniture for 40 years. Okay. And uh, he has uh, two nephews, and they have children. And I have no biological children. And okay. That wasn't my choice. It just didn't work out. Sure. So. Uh, what was grade uh, Tell us about high school, but was grade school small in your town? Then? Grade school was small. Uh, and you know, I don't remember those numbers. I do remember my high school graduating class, which was the largest was 147. Now this was a county school, but that's that was very large. Before that, there had never been but 100. Sure. And I really don't know if that's still the main, the largest class that graduated or okay. not. But um, we, ha we had to go to Asheville to do things like take tap dancing or take ballet or um, uh, those kinds of things. It was 60 miles away then, and it was on a two-lane road, and it was a good two-hour trip. Now it's sure. about an hour trip to Asheville on a right, four-lane exactly. road, so it's totally different. But we had everything that all little towns had at that time. We had brownies and Girl Scouts and uh, lots of church activities and all kinds of sports. I was not athletic. I was a cheerleader, and I loved it. And that's how I originally hurt my knees. Um, um, 
because, and back then, there was no, this would have been the mid-50s, there was no such thing as sports medicine, no such thing as uh, orthopedic surgeons that worked on teenagers. They didn't even work on the football players that got hurt, so they certainly wouldn't have done anything for the anybody else. For anybody else. But right. um, I ended up with, with two bad knees, and the one of the main reasons for that goes back to the, an early injury when I was 16. Yeah. So, and they just <laughs> said, stay off of it till you feel better. You know, I'd probably do it all again because it. I, was, I loved high school. I remember... In my senior class, um, a handful of us were invited to Silva, North Carolina, which is about 20 miles away, to go be on a radio talk show about our senior experiences. And I was the only one that was crying because I so loved high school, I was going to really miss it. The others say, oh, I can't wait to get out of here, and I'm, I can't wait to graduate, and I can't wait to go do this and do that. And I... I was I started crying during the interview because I had loved it. Oh, okay. So then, uh, how did you select where you went to college? Tell us about college. Well, I actually wanted. I was interested in home economics. I was in the home economics everything in high school. I wasn't in 4-H because we weren't a farm family, and um, I um, actually wanted to go to UT University of Tennessee. It was only 80 miles from my home. And my dad said, that's fine, but you will need to pay the difference between the in-state tuition here and the out-of-state in Tennessee. So I went to the home ec school in North Carolina, which had been the woman's college of the University of North Carolina. And it was the year that I started, it changed to University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Okay. And they had a very large home economics school. And I actually entered... Um, uh, child development, or that was the major that I thought that I wanted to do. But, but I, uh, this is kind of weird. Um, at that time, college graduates in child development almost had to go on for a master's degree, or they weren't even. We didn't even have daycares then, so they weren't even glorified daycare leaders. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to bite off a, a graduate degree, so I changed to. Um, and the reasoning won't make sense. I changed to foods and nutrition, and I had been a waitress all through high school in this little town, and I loved it. If I had to go back and say jobs I'd loved, I absolutely loved being a waitress. I just loved it. Now, remember, most of these people were staying at our motel two doors up the street, and I really knew them. And sure. Anyway, um, so I went into foods and nutrition, and what's odd about that is uh, to become a registered dietitian, and a lot of people don't realize this, there is a fifth year requirement. It's called a dietetic internship. Mm -hmm. And so I really, after I graduated, still had to do another sure. year to get credentialed. It's very much like a, an RN for this clinical uh, component that you have to do. And I went to Duke University Medical Center for my dietetic internship. I loved it. Um, they employed me, so I stayed there and worked for a year. And I, um, that was the bulk of my clinical experience, but it helped me so much later in teaching sure. dietetics. I had, uh, uh, I was responsible for wards that women were in that were in their last stages of cancer. And at that, chemo was just coming out then. And we, there was not a way to save them. And they had lots of eating difficulties. So um, uh, there was a dietitian assigned yeah, uh, just to them. And I also um, worked two pediatric wards. And Duke was a regional medical center for genetic pediatric problems. And both the wards were full of children with cystic fibrosis. Mm -hmm. And now people with cystic fibrosis live to be 50 sometimes. But then... They hardly ever made it past ten. Yeah. Okay. okay, so those were those were good experiences, and so I I had started then thinking, well, you know, getting a master's degree wouldn't be so awful, and um, this opportunity, I I'd just been so lucky because it wasn't anything that I did, but as I thought back over my career, I was just in the right place at the right time. It seemed like 
nothing I engineered, it just happened. And um, at that time, there was a lot of money through the U.S. Public Health um, uh, Department in Washington, D.C., service, U.S. Public Health Service in Washington, D.C., for people to get master's degree, and your master's degree was totally paid for. And you didn't even have to be a teaching assistant or a research assistant or anything. They, they needed public health nutritionists, public health nurses, people in maternal and child health. And so um, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill is one of the renowned schools of public health in the country. And they had eight of these. They were just kind of given away. <laughs> and Durham, where I was working at Duke, is 10 miles away. So I didn't even have to move. I could stay. I had a roommate, and I could stay with her, same apartment. And so um, the only thing that I had to pay, in fact, it paid a stopping, was just unreal, because they haven't had those now for 30 or 40 years. Okay, It was just unreal. Okay, but this was, uh, I graduated from college in 69, so this was 71, 72, 73, and that was a time right after the Vietnam War and uh, the economy was booming and there was a lot of money in education. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll well. do it, might as well. <laughs> and the um, only thing I had to pay that whole year was my car insurance. I mean, it was kind of unreal. That's great. Anyway, and that was a wonderful experience because at the end of that experience, there was another um, internship type experience which they called a traineeship and uh, you were sent all over the United States to different places and I had um, chosen Michigan and at the last minute um, and I, there was a boyfriend in Michigan that's the that I'd met at Duke that's the only reason I chose Michigan but at the last minute the Michigan Department of Public Health decided they couldn't take a student for that experience. It was a four-month experience. And I got sent to Washington, D.C., and it was the most wonderful place oh, to be oh, yeah. in public health. And and it was the summer of Watergate. <laughs> I mean, it's just fascinating wow. to be in Washington. It was also the summer when Camille came through and shut down the federal government for about a week and a half. I mean, just totally shut them down. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, so it was just, it was a wonderful experience. And that ended up being so wonderful because the contacts that I made um, through the public health traineeship, which were people in USDA and people in what was then health educational welfare, now it's health and human services. I, when I came here, one of the courses I developed was a course in public health nutrition. And I just had all the contacts and all the wonderful. materials just and everything. It just, it just was, I can't believe it, okay. And it was also the summer, the summer that I was there was 1973, and the big nutrition public health program that was uh, being on a trial basis that summer, only in Washington, D.C., was the Women, Infant, Children's Nutrition Program, the WIC program. Well, that program's still going on. That was where it started. Wow. And so part of my experiences were um, I went to all the clinics in Washington that housed uh, women, infant, children, and that was they were all in public health clinics that were in the bottom of the poorest of the poor high-rise buildings for the poor. I saw a lot. Anyway, <laughs> and that was just a happen so. And then that program went nationwide and it's still going. Sure. And it's an extremely... Um, done very well. Done very well program, right, right. anyway. Um, then I, in my um, Master's of Public Health uh, graduate class, was a lady who was teaching at Meredith College, which was a private... I think it was Baptist College for women in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's right across the street from NC State, North Carolina State. And she only had a master's degree, and they were um, insisting that to keep her job there, she needed to complete a PhD. So she had come back to Chapel Hill to get a PhD, but she needed to find somebody to fill in for her for only one year. 
she had done all the coursework, but she needed to do her research, and she was having trouble finding somebody. And I and I was on leave from Duke. I could have gone back to Duke, um, and I loved being a clinical dietitian. Absolutely loved it. But I thought, well, it's just for a year. Why don't I? Try Give it a try. And again, I could drive to Raleigh. It was only about 30 miles away. So I never had to move from Durham to do the master's and, and end up uh, working at Meredith. So I did it, knowing it was just for a year. And it was in a very small college, traditional home economics department. And um, But I only taught the, the nutrition and the foods courses. There was somebody that covered the clothing courses I sewed, but I certainly couldn't have taught clothing and the family relations and all the other. And I was there for a year, and at the end of that year, I was really enjoying my teaching. And this is weird, too. There was an ad in the back of the journal for a job at Purdue, and I would never, ever have even paid it any attention, but whoever had typed it up had left out that they wanted, they preferred a Ph.D., that was uh, said that they wanted a registered dietitian, and Purdue was interested in setting up uh, what's now a very um, popular program here that that got set up later after I got here, called the Coordinated Program in Dietetics, where instead of the students graduating from the didactic program that I ended up directing, and then going somewhere else for an internship, the Coordinated Program took that fifth year and coordinated it within five years using local facilities. And that was, uh, the internships were quite expensive. There were not enough, only the best students got them. And so big schools all across the country with dietetics curriculums were interested in seeing what they could do to enhance getting more of their seniors to the, our, the registered dietitian credential. And this was one way to do it. And so they were interested in somebody with recent clinical experience with at least a master's. And they had left out of the ad that they, I don't know if they left out preferred PhD or wanted PhD. I would never have applied. Okay, so I applied and um, two or three other people applied. I came up here for an interview in May and it was the week after graduation and this place was dead. This place, there was nobody really moving. Good, good. And I was put up in the union, and I remember going out to walk, and I walked up and um, toward Mackey, and I didn't know what Mackey was. Here was this huge, round building. I never, this was like 7, 7.30 at night. I never saw another soul. It was a beautiful campus. And when we flew in, I flew in over fields being plowed, and I'd never been anywhere where it was flat. <laughs> And I'd never seen anything like I'd seen here. But anyway, um, they offered me the job, and they were very honest that they didn't have a clue and that I should not expect that it would probably lead to tenure because they, 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 first of all, they didn't know how I would do, and secondly, they just didn't usually hire people without a Ph.D., okay? But they needed somebody with recent clinical experiences to start setting up negotiations with all the hospitals uh, for the clinical experiences. So um, I came here in, um, I started July 1, 1973, and that was where I knew that you were in the same building, apartment building that I was, and I was in those apartments for a year before I moved to a duplex. Um, and uh, just, the, the lady that I replaced had retired, and I was on a 12-month appointment, and I, I, I'm kind of a real hybrid because they hardly, I don't think they have me's anymore, but anyway, which is fine. I was on a 100% teaching assignment, okay? So I taught a lot of courses, and I taught the senior level courses that the dietitians took, and I took the dietitians majors took, and then some basic nutrition courses. And while I was here, I um, I worked on them developing a coordinated program, but it became so important that they actually hired a director for the coordinated program within about a year. And we had, a, in 1976, so that would have been two years after I were here, we had a pilot group go through, 
and then they hired a director and it became a separate program from the didactic program. Why don't you talk, you were a director of that, and that was one of the yeah. things, and tell us a little, or tell us about that. Um, a fascinating experience, okay. There, there were not, um, and I still don't think there probably are today, there, uh, the American Dietetic Association was making the decision to go from a proven didactic programs, which was just the academic program before you then graduated and went to a dietetic internship at a medical center. Um, and they were in the process of deciding to accredit those. So the curriculum, um, uh, it was very scientifically oriented, but other than that, it was like English or history or anything else. And none of those programs are accredited. So everybody was scared to death of becoming accredited because there's a huge self-study that you write and there's a five-year report and data to collect all the time in between. And um, uh, that we, I, let's see, the didactic programs moved to accreditation in the mid 80s, so about 10 years after I got here. Okay. Well, one of the things that I had gotten very interested in was my professional association. Fortunately, I started with the local. There's a local dietetic group, and I got interested in the state, state group and went through all the offices there. And, and because of that, then, I got elected on the national level. And, and um, I don't really think this was foresight on my part. It, just happened. I was put on a lot of committees that had to do with are we going to accredit dietetic programs. And so it wasn't scary for us because I saw what was coming and I saw what they were going to require and and I could go on and prepare the faculty for that and start collecting data and putting things in place and and um, I mean right in the first self-study there was no one, there was not one to read to go by and so that was a little scary, but um, I'd been in the committees that had come up with all the criteria of what they wanted. So it, uh, sure. and I did that my whole career in dietetics, and I think that that really made a huge difference because I kept, I could see what was coming, and I could keep Purdue ahead of things before they right. ever became required, right. and and collect data that was going to be necessary, and so. That's what being director of the pro program was, okay. okay. And um, and like any accredited program, you had to you had to. This is way beyond what the alumni would cr collect because they wanted to know how many of your majors went on to be credentialed and what was their percentage acceptance into dietetic internships. And most years we were ninety five to one hundred percent, and there were curriculums in the country that were 50 and 60 percent yeah. okay now they have a standard that you have to be 80 um, and I was in the golden years I was in the golden years of all that and anyway. that's great and yeah you can look it back was, on that's a great credit it, it was right. just a, it was the right. golden years of, of all that right. and because of becoming active in the association and being one of the initial people active in that move from approval to a credit all we did is approval was mail in our curriculum and answer any questions if an office in Chicago had any answers. Well, in the accreditation process, there was a site visit, okay. and there were people that reviewed your curriculum on paper, and you never knew who they were from across the United States. Well, um, the people that were initially involved in that got deemed specialists, or the people that were supposed to tell the other people what to do. So. I was giving presentations all over the United States to different groups about this, and I was just talking about what we'd done here. And it was really interesting. Purdue has an outstanding dietetic program, but a, and it, it's outstanding in every way, academically, faculty, every way. But the biggest part of it was the perception that we were. <laughs> I mean, if that program director is out there teaching everybody else and, and doing site visits and uh, the perception is, oh wow, Purdue's program must be phenomenal, right. you know, because They're here's right this director They're on the program all the right. time. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, it's an, it's an, it is an engagement uh, for sure. the program, and so our program uh, has always just really been on the map, which is great, uh, which was wonderful. Right, and you were closely yeah. involved in it, which is yeah, great. and and, and um, 
I was not fortunate enough to have biological children, and so I had time to do that. That would have been uh, difficult, I think, uh, sure. with a young family, but I didn't have a young family. Right. And I you had, kept in touch with a lot of the students over time. Yes. Right. Uh, well, that experience, being a site visitor and being a panel reviewer for other programs, was so important because, like when I was in Washington, I developed this network in public health that never went away. All those people like me have just retired. They they stayed in those positions forever. Well, in the Dietetic National, I developed this network all over the country. So when a student at Purdue said, you know, I'm getting married and I'm moving to Oregon. What am I going to do to find a job out there? I knew somebody that she could call, <laughs> you know, yeah. or I'm moving to Texas or I'm or I'm, I, I wanted, I wanted, I don't want to go to uh, the internships. There's a big internship at IU Medical Center and still is. I don't want to stay in Indiana. I want to go somewhere else. Well, I, I knew all those people. And, and you were um, a great contact. And right? it, 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 it was wonderful. And when we had, we always had some students that did not get accepted. It's extremely competitive to go on to the next level. At, at one point, if a student didn't have a 3.4, and two or three summer work experiences and, of course, excellent letters of rec, they wouldn't get in. It was that hard. And we always had some excellent students. Our 2.8, 2.5 students were excellent compared to a lot. Right. And I knew those internship directors, and they knew me, and they knew my standards, and I could call them up and say, "Do you, you know, we have a really outstanding student. I'll stand behind her. Do you have any openings? So we ended right. up getting all our students in. Right. And it was that network. That helps a lot. It, 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 was, it was so important. That it, personal it, thing. It, it was so important. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And um, I loved working with the students. And, I, again, I was kind of a real hybrid because I did as much ca I, counseling as I did teaching. Again, we'll talk a little bit about my involvement in research, but I was very much a teacher and a counselor and my door was open all the time to students and um, I think I think being a at that time I think you have to have a great presence in the classroom and be teaching the right thing and be fair and all of this but you also have to be um, a mentor and be able to open doors for them exactly. okay That's and uh, and our departments no different we our department um, brought in a lot of research dollars in extremely important areas, calcium, vitamin D, cancer, vitamin right. E, heart disease. And those people were happy to not be saddled with very much undergraduate teaching. I hope that's not inappropriate no, to say, but they were happy. They and I was happy with what I did, and so was, they were happy with me. It was so synergistic. Right. It was just, and, and right. um, I wish there was more of that because there are great teachers out there that, that could be used right. that would Good be great point. mentors with the, right. with the kids and let, and let the researchers do their thing. That's right. You know. And you're, and, all, we're, all, you're yeah, all working for the same We're road. all working for the same thing. Yeah. And, on different roads. Uh, on different roads. Right. And little by little, uh, our department started getting involved in metabolic studies where you actually bring in human subjects rather than just doing research on lab animals. You actually bring in human subjects and feed them defined diets for weeks or whatever and collect stuff and all. And they, uh, in the early 90s, when Connie Weaver came um, to Purdue, um, they started getting involved in metabolic studies, and they're still really big. You may have heard of the camp calcium studies. Sure, Those right. are metabolic studies where um, different age groups are brought. Yes, yeah. that's how I really got into research. Um, I was never a principal investigator. I was a co-investigator and a collaborating investigator. But when they got involved in the metabolic studies, lo and behold, one of the two years I was at Duke, I worked as the research dietitian in the metabolic center. So I had done metabolically controlled diets. Nobody else here had done that. I just you happened understand. to have that right. skill set. And so um, I... Uh, took and that's how so they put me on the grant as a collaborating investigator because they needed a metabolic dietitian okay and 
that at that time that research was primarily done in the summer so I could I was on a 12-month teaching but other people could teach what I taught in the summer and I could do that in the summer oh, so yeah. the cap calcium um, greatly enhanced my career and I got my name on all these publications I wouldn't have That's gotten my great. name on or whatever which which only mattered because I was I never envisioned I got ten. I got. I was hired in as an instructor. Now they hardly do that, and I got promoted to an assistant professor because that didn't carry tenure with it, and I got promoted to an associate, which did ter- carry tenure with it. And I knew that I would never be promoted further without the PhD and writing my own. But I was happy. That's right. I was yeah. doing what I wanted to do. So and I, you're making your contribution, and you're making yeah, your life. Yeah, I was. So I was happy. That's yeah. Right. That's yeah, fine. I was happy. Okay. Um, we also at that time, and I, I don't think they do much of this anymore, but that's okay. At that time, there were um, a lot of, about half of our graduate students were coming here for a master's degree and about half for a PhD. Now it's like out of 50 or 60 graduate students, all but five or six of them are PhD. So that changed. But at that time, during my time here, there were a lot of people coming back. Some of them were coming back to become an RD via their master's degree. And we had a program set up for them to do that. And they weren't interested in working in what's called bench research in a lab and answering cellular scientific questions. And that certainly was not my expertise. They were interested in developing nutrition education materials to take what the lab was finding out out to the public. And there were only several of us um, to really mentor them in developing nutrition education things. So I ended up with a slew of of grad students, one or two every year, so a slew over the career, all of which were doing just interesting different things. I mean, and most of them, most of the time, we, we were never generating the information. We were taking the information that was already generated from sometimes our department and sharing it with people who needed it. And whatever the student's interest is, we could work. For example, there was a five-year, 10-year time of period there when food irradiation was a big topic. And we had a graduate student that wanted to do a slide set on food irradiation to use with consumers. And so we did that. And all of them were validated, all of them. Um, um, In fact, while I was at Purdue, I took some other some graduate courses in developing exams because I didn't know how to write exam questions and statistics because I didn't really have a good enough from public health statistics it's totally different it's like birth and death rates and so I needed statistics so that we could validate uh, survey tools and educational tools so I took courses in that so I felt okay overseeing them sure okay and we did really interesting things. We developed a wonderful set for people that had cancer that were undergoing chemotherapy and had all these nutritional problems. Went back to my experience at Duke. And um, it was a slide set that we could show them tips on how to eat because at the time when that was developed, it wouldn't work today. Um, nausea and not being able to eat when you were going through cancer treatment could kill more people than the cancer did. Okay. Um, now they have drugs to take care of that, but there was a time period when they didn't. Right. So, right. Um, and we developed a lot that were used in WIC, introducing first foods to baby and introducing foods that would come from a food bank or a food kitchen, all of those kinds of things. So in a way it was extension. I, I could have easily been justified in having an extension appointment. It was kind of just worked in extension nicely. kind of things. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but... Thanks. It just worked out. Yeah, that's great. Just you talked a little out. about your research. And any other comment? Um, I, I loved being involved with Camp Cal Team. I did the kitchen. I s- always tell people I had the input. I didn't have to deal with the output because in a metabolic study, they have to collect urine and feces and all the output, and somebody's got to do that in a lab. And, <laughs> and, um, um, and the, it was a stinky end. situation, which was a problem because there's a cafeteria in the building. <laughs> anyway, there isn't now, but there were just lots of issues to work out. I had the input data. On the other hand, somebody said it correctly, the kitchen worked um, 
from about 5.30 in the morning till about 9 at night, okay, because um, uh, the lab people were managing to get it done from 7 to 5 or whatever, but we worked one day ahead because we had to prepare the food, then we had to weigh it to one hundredth of a gram for every serving. So if there were 30 kids, we had to weigh out 30, and then one for a composite that would go to the lab to be analyzed to make sure that what we thought they were getting is what they were getting. So we knew exactly what they were getting. Um, we, Dr. Weaver was the first one to work with adolescent groups, uh, which is when calcium is so absorbed and, and is uh, renowned now for um, developing the data, the research studies and coming up with the data about how much calcium 14-year-olds need. And uh, at The first group that we had was a group of grad students, so we saw what 21-year-old need. And, they don't absorb near what 11, 12, 13 year olds did. So we kept coming down in age group. But I didn't have to work with policing these kids. We had groups of, I mean, there was one counselor for every two kids because here they were on campus in a sorority house. Every summer was a different sorority house with a different kitchen. Anyway, I thought about that. Anyway, really but I that. had institutional food experience in my undergraduate curriculum. And in my dietetic internship, so I knew how to, what to do with the dishwashers and the steam jacket kittles and all that. Yes. And we had to work a day ahead to weigh everything out. We needed lots of refrigeration space. Um, we had to work with um, the retailers to get the same lot number because we didn't want we wanted every serving of Cheerios to be the same. And they are among the big companies. Uh, you can pretty much do that, but we still re reweighed everything. We never trusted their weight. Yeah. And that ended up being terribly important, important, just one story about that. Obviously, these students drank milk because it was a calcium study, and you would have thought that we could give them those little cartons of milk, those little half pints of milk, and a straw and make sure that they sucked it all up and drank all of it, and then they had to rinse it out and drink one swallow of the water to make sure they were getting. You would think we could have done that uh, without, with it all being standard. No, we weighed about 30 of those and none of them were the same weight. The milk that was in the carton was not the and it and it differed enough for our study it wouldn't work. So we even had to pour out the milk into cups and weigh it. Okay. Yeah, that's a job. It was, yeah, it was just a, it was, it was just a job anyway. Mm -hmm. And it was um, two, three week periods in the summer of no time off. It was really Seven intense. days. It was seven days a week, no time. I had um, students working for me. It was great for the dietetic students because they could get a recommendation from somebody that they worked for that was an RD when they were going for this internship. They already knew everything about metabolic studies. There were very few universities that could offer dietetic students that kind of summer work experience. Good. Yeah, lucked out. so we right. lucked out. Is that and a number of them went on to become research dietitians. It's and that's where it started. That's still going on. Oh, is it? Um, uh, Connie Weaver, the current department head, is the brilliant force behind all those grants and they were health and human services grants, very the highest level that you can get. And um, they were, when I retired, they were doing, I've been retired seven years, they were, six years, they were doing them every other summer because they're so massive. It takes several years then to um, to really evaluate, to the, evaluate data. the data. There's right. so many pieces of data. Right. And they're, they're still, I think they're still pretty much on that every other summer. They've now done, since I retired, they've done a group of Oriental teenagers, and they had to go all the way to Chicago to get um, Oriental Chinese and Japanese, and, and they have to go um, uh, recruit. Bertine Martin is her research associate, and she's a master about all that. And um, they started doing other uh, ethnic backgrounds. They've done a group of, I guess maybe this is the last one I did, yes, um, that were all black teenagers. And that was interesting because at that time we were still 
the College of Consumer and Family Sciences, and Dennis Saviano was dean, and his research area was lactose intolerance. So he could hook on to this grant for calcium absorption for the black subjects and do some lactose things because they, the black population has a much more severe problem with lactose intolerance. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So just lots of interesting things. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and as, as Purdue got more involved in that clinical research area, um, there's a lot of collaborative research now with IU Med Center. In fact, from the beginning, all of the students that were subjects had their physicals at IU and they would be given isotopes so we knew how a certain amount of calcium that would track throughout their body and all that happened at IU. And when they would go down there for the day we had to pack all the meals. And just it was I had a great career. I know. I had and a you look back career. on it. How did uh I think a researcher would be interested. How would you recruit the people for this uh, camp? They went to schools, and oh. coming to Purdue for summer camp was big. And so they tried. Initially, these were all um, area uh, junior high and high school students. And in, they what, in Indiana? In, in, no, here. Really, they could get them from around here. Oh, okay. Well, they would go to Mayflower Mill sure, okay. or uh, the county, but way locally, out in the county, the but county. they could get them locally. Um, and... Um, I think for the black group, she got a lot out of Indianapolis that had larger populations of those. And then I know they went all the way to Chicago to do an Oriental group. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't really remember if that was Chinese or Vietnamese or Japanese or whether it was a combination. Yeah. I think researchers, these are uh, girls. Yes, you know, they so were all women, girls. Women. Okay. Actually, one of the camps also was boys. Oh, okay. And that was after I left. That was a real challenge, I understand. Oh, I bet. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you, 14 and 15-year-old girls are a real challenge on a campus with university-age boys. I'm sure. It was Did, very interesting. What would... Uh, I just heard the stories. I didn't have to do. What other activities did they have? Did they take any classes? Yes. They, How no. Did, what? They entertained them. Uh, the so they 14 had hours a day till they were exhausted and went to bed. Okay. Okay. They did um, some fun things in a computer lab with a computer. The, uh, the younger the girl was, uh, they were really interested in arts and crafts. Okay. And there was money in the grant to, to buy arts and crafts stuff. They were taken on field trips. The first camp, they were actually in camp over the 4th of July, and we learned really quickly that wasn't a good idea. So after that, the first three weeks always ended before the 4th, and the 4th of July was off, and then the next three weeks happened. Okay. Um, um, anything that was going on in camp, oh, it was um, the June camp was always during the 4-H Roundup or Future Farmers, or one of them was. So we got, now this was just 30 kids, so we got permission for them to do sure. all the dances and the activities, and they got to go to the pool every day. Um, and so they they were kept really, really busy. The people that did the activity, they kept them busy. They were tired at night. Well, that's and right. that was the point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, uh, let me talk just a little bit. Um, I'm, see, I'm trying to keep it to an hour, but then maybe what we might want to do, some other things, we do a part two. So okay, great. Going, that's uh, great. Okay. Great. Um, it's a lot there, of fun to talk about yourself. I know. That's great. <laughs> Let's talk... Um, um, jumping back a little bit, a couple of the committees you're on, particularly, uh, I thought the you were the chair of the Athletic Affairs Committee. I think researchers would be interested in that. Now, you know. I absolutely loved that committee. That came kind of at the end of my career. And you were the chair of it? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that was kind of in the right place at the right time, too. It is generally a five-year commitment on that committee. And you rotate up to be chairman in your fifth year. Well, in my fourth year, the professor who would have been chairman, um, or in my third year, the professor that would have been chairman one of the next years was in biology, and he's still on the committee. He was elected one of the two faculty reps from Purdue to the NCAA. And so that took him out of the rotation for chair, and I just happened to be the next one up, so I ended up being chair for two years. 
Jeff Bolin, who is real big in biological research in the School of Science. And so I ended up, anyway, I love that committee because of everything that I've been involved in, I didn't know anything about athletics at the university. And it's, um, I'm a huge fan of Morgan Burks. I think he's one of the best administrators I ever met and ever worked with. He, re he really has a wonderful staff that he mentors and they all pull together and uh, he's a great uh, financial person to have done all that he's done because we don't bring in near the money that Ohio State and Penn State and Michigan does and, and he's upgraded all these facilities and he doesn't spend money he doesn't have. He's Anyway, I'm a big fan of Morgan Burks, but it was fascinating. My husband and I love Purdue sports. We've always had season football tickets. We don't have season basketball tickets. And I just learned all the NCAA rules and why they exist and what you can do and what you can't do. And it was totally different. It was, it was totally different. And I'm not sure, well, I do know how I got tagged for that. Okay, the faculty, um, I don't know if they still do this or not. Every year you get a card, and it comes from a Senate committee. I was not on this committee in the well, then, Senate. Well, I love like, my what Senate like committees. To serve on. You, that check you get it. Thing. What now, you now would like to online. serve on, right. and supposedly most people don't even bother to send it back in, and the, there's something like four or five pages full of people that have checked Athletic Affairs Committee. I guess I always send it back in, and I guess at some point I must have checked that committee. <laughs> so anyway, just popped yeah. up. And um, I loved it because I was um, chair of that committee during Tiller's years. <laughs> Again, I just lucked out. I was at the right place at the right time. And those were the years we were going to all these neat bowl games. And I saw on your list one of, the, one of the things was favorite Purdue tradition. And the first thing that popped in my mind, unfortunately, isn't a tradition, but it was Rose Bowl. <laughs> unfortunately, that's, that's not a tradition. Well, it's I think okay. the Purdue graduation, when I rethought about it, is my favorite Purdue tradition because I've now attended my two stepdaughters' graduations um, at major institutions, and they were a circus. I mean, compared to ours, they were a total circus. They were in a gym, and all the kids had all this stuff written on their hats, and they were laughing and talking, and nobody heard the speaker. Or it, it was just so irreverent, and Purdue's is so special. Do a good job. So I hope they never change that. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also one other committee I think researchers would be interested in is the um, – Senate of the, you remember the University Senate Advisory Committee. Yes. All right, you might take comment on that. That is a, fan, that's a, that's a fascinating that's committee a because committee that is that, the committee that has actually the chairs of the other Senate right. committees make up that committee. Right. And it's fascinating. It meets once a month with the president in Hovde. And it's not that you are given any information that anybody else can't have. But you understand the way the upper administration's thinking. And one of the things that I had figured out early on because I was on the board of directors of the American Dietetic Association is we complain about lots of things as faculty or students or whatever, and we really don't have any idea what the people above us are grappling with. And they, they can't let you know everything. It's not that they're hiding anything. They're just at another level, and they're dealing with issues at another level. And when you see that level, you understand why some of the decisions were made the way they were. That's so right. that was a unique experience because it was over uh, both Bering and Jiski's tenure as president. And so I'm good friends with them. Right. I otherwise would probably have met them, but it's a very special committee. It's I think a very it, special that committee. That a lot of people don't are not aware of it, but it uh, and I, yeah. I know that I know the membership. But you know, it's, and nice it's, that it's one hour. One one meets at, at uh, all my best committees met at three thirty on Friday. My friends in dietetics used to say, and this was people from University of Texas and all over, and they would say. They had mutiny on our campus if there was a meeting at 3.30 on Friday afternoon. <laughs> well, that's when we used to have our faculty meetings, and it was never a problem. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> it was just kind of funny who was committed and who wasn't. That's right, yeah. Anyway. Well, that's good. I think this is a stopping point. I'm going to... Okay. Um, uh, and then I...